we are moving to to the panel art and design modes of corporeality and uh, i'm absolutely thrilled to uh present our next keynote speaker uh, uh grace uh dr grace lise maffey uh grace is with us here and uh, um Grace is professor of art uh, of design history, uh, School of Creative Arts, uh, director of the Heritage Professional Doctorate in Heritage School of Humanities, University of Hertfordshire, the UK, founding chair, uh, Network of Women Plus professors, and uh, also uh, book series co editor for Cultural Histories of Design with Hetel Fallen. Uh, and Grace. Um, has established the importance of mediation in understanding design and its histories using domesticity, national identity and globalization, Italian design and transatlantic design as examples. So Grace uh, today uh, is uh, giving a paper, hands at home. Oh, it's a question, hands at home, textures, tactility and touch in interior design. Grace, hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I will share my screen. Can you see that? All good. You can see it? Yes, we can see it. Uh, you, can, you can only just make it full screen probably. Yes, I can. There we go. Okay. Good. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, this talk I'm giving today is part of a longer uh, piece of work. And so um, I just want to very, very quickly um, mention that if I had more time, I would provide you with an introduction to what I'm about to say that would um, make it clear that I'm aware that the senses work collectively. Our senses work as a series of inputs um, with various affinities, sight and sound, hearing and touch, uh, taste and smell, uh, but that I'm isolating touch in a very artificial way uh, for reasons of practicality in order to narrow down the data field, basically. And in doing so, I'm also narrowing down the field of interior design and focusing only on domestic interiors in my, in my talk today. And that's perhaps more justifiable because um, I'm arguing that interiority is a, a product of touch experiences and that um, interiority in the home uh, has a very, um, specific relationship to comfort. So the sense of touch, the interior and the domestic interior particularly form a cogent um, area of study, I would argue. So the main part of my paper today looks at three attributes of modernism and asks how a focus on touch might um, provide new knowledge about those attributes of modernism. The first attribute that I'm going to look at is elimination or reduction or minimalism. The second is functionalism. And the third is technological developments, particularly those relating to materials. So to start with, elimination as a practice that enhances the sense of touch. Interior design, as you know, is a process of planning and a meaning of design is the verb to plan. Another is the noun plan. Interiors focus on spatial, interior designers, sorry, focus on spatial planning, how people move through and use spaces and places, as well as how best to deploy furniture and furnishings, including soft furnishings. This planning proceeds or occurs alongside the practical activities of realizing a planned interior, such as construction, fabrication, installation, and decoration. 
Planning is not simply intellectual. It involves ideation, but also it involves sourcing materials using manufacturer's samples. Decisions about materials are made with budget, utility and application in mind, but also in response to aesthetics and how things feel. Interior components fabricated by a designer or studio commissioned to design a, an interior usually sit alongside uh, the selection and combination of pre-existing manufactured elements, such as floor finishes, furniture, wall treatments, lighting, etc. Touch is key in selecting these combinatory elements. That touch is a crucial aspect of interior design is demonstrated by the persistence in the age of computer aided design of physical mood boards, a tactile mix of inspiration and information. The interior that's produced in the mind's eye of the designer is visible in design sketches and imagining how the space will feel is assisted by sample swatches on mood boards and in manufacturers catalogues. The mood board is a place where interior designers collect their ideas and plan their designs, but it's also a tool of communication with studio colleagues, clients, contractors, fabricators and other stakeholders. Mood boards ensure that touch is part of the interior design process as well as part of its result. The planning that interior designers undertake includes anticipating and designing users sensory experiences, including touch. Sensory responses to design are not purely a factor of consumption, they're designed into products and places. An analytical approach to, to interiors focused on the senses and here touch specifically brings together therefore the production and consumption of design. Interior design has developed as a professional practice during the modern period, broadly defined, in ways increasingly distinct from both architecture on the one hand and decoration on the other. The central importance of comfort in the Victorian interior, communicated in contemporary domestic advice books, was challenged by modernist designers who reimagined the home and its comfort. The modern movement in design provided a context for the professionalization of interior design in the 20th century. Modernism or modernisms are best understood as a collection of tendencies rather than a style. Here I'm going to examine, as I said, three key tendencies of modernism, showing how a focus on touch yields new understanding in the interplay of people and their object worlds in domestic interiors. The first, as I've said, that I'm going to focus on is elimination. Elimination is an important stream in modernism from Mies van der Rohe's following Peter Barron's personal motto, less is more, to Dieter Ram's 1984 injunction that we must omit the unimportant because good design is as little design as possible. Adolf Lowe's infamously associated ornament with degeneracy and crime. A striking example of elimination in design is the bedroom that Loos designed for his wife, Lena Loos, in 1903. This remarkable room provides only what is essential for a bedroom, albeit in luxurious, sensual style. It's dominated by an enormous white Angora rabbit fur rug, which climbs up the sides of the divan bed covered in a simple white silk bedspread. The walls and windows alike are shielded by a white wraparound curtain made from cambric with a flounce at the hem that exactly matches the flounce skirts for two bedside tables and a dressing table. The effect is both dramatic and calming. Through elimination, Loos has reduced the visual load of the space and intensified the impact of its tactile textural appeal. He set the stage for sleep or passion or splendid isolation. A person contemplating the room may wish to lay on the rug more than the bed and true re relaxation in the space may require first pulling back the curtain to see what it conceals. Lowe's here presents a version of luxury updated for modernism. 
he employs long-standing status symbols in the form of luxury materials made from animal products, fur and silk, in conjunction with qualities which might retrospectively be termed stealth wealth, luxuries of space, the ability to resource the labour required to maintain a white or cream interior. Through elimination, Lowe's intensifies the experience of comfort through textures which appeal to the senses of touch, deep pearl fur, smooth silk and crisp drapery. This is a reconstruction for an exhibition. This 1903 interior could not be a clearer rejection of the overstuffed 19th century domestic interior. It can also be seen in retrospect as anticipating both the white modern interior design of Siri Morn and minimalism in interior design exemplified by the work of John Pawson. See for instance John Pawson's home farm 2013 to 19 where architect and client are one. About this project Pawson says, over the course of more than 30 years, a body of work has accumulated based on the objective of making simple spaces with just what is required and nothing more, where the eye feels as comfortable as the body. At the heart of everything has been the idea of refining by removing, meticulously paring away until what is left cannot be improved by further reduction sensual space where the primary experience is of the quality of light, materials and proportions. Feminist design historians have contributed much to the understanding of modernism, interior design, the relationship of architecture, design and decoration and domesticity, often critiquing minimalism and its variants as masculinist practices. An interior design history attentive to touch enables recognition of what elimination offers as much as what it takes away. Interior design, um, in interior design, elimination and minimalism are strategies which remove sensory stimuli and thereby enable an enhanced sensory experience. Another modernist design tenet that I'm going to look at today uh, derives from that of appropriateness of form, uh, derived in turn from the design reformers of the 19th century. Architect Louis Sullivan's proposal that form follows function underpins the machine aesthetic, the idea that machines are beautiful. Le Corbusier regarded the house as a machine for living in and theorized it as such. His interiors form some of the clearest demonstrations of the machine aesthetic, characterized by shiny metal, painted metal, tiles on floors and walls, and minimal furniture and furnishings. Although they may seem devoid of home comforts when compared with many other homes, Le Corbusier's domestic interiors engage the sense of touch just as resoundingly as Lowe's furry bedroom. As Ilse Crawford notes, early modern movement houses, although clinical in, in appearance, were meant to be temples of the senses. Visitors to Le Corbusier's interiors are guided by the interior elements that he designed into them. Tim Benton's 1975 filmed visit to Corbusier's and Pierre Genere's Villa Savoy, 1928 to 31, makes clear that the house was designed to be experienced as a continuous route up and around from the galleried pathway created by the Pilotis on which the house sits, up through the rooms to the roof terrace. While not necessarily forming part of the visitor's promenade tour, the pantry, there's um, some of my photographs of the Villa Savoy indicating how you're guided around the space by the um, handrails and walkways, staircases. So going to the pantry, I'm showing you the scullery and a detail from the pantry here. 
while not necessarily forming part of the visitors promenade tour, the pantry has good sight lines throughout the first floor of the home and shows Le Corbusier's attention to detail in terms of hardware. So there's a Corbusian cupboard um, hand pull or knob. And more on his attention to detail in terms of hardware here. When visitors grasp and turn the metal door handles at Villa Savoy, which match the ones at Maison La Roche, another of Corbusier's houses in Paris, and open window locks, ascend staircases and sloping walkways in these houses, they become cogs in Le Corbusier's living machine. He and Genere have designed our sensory experiences and left a script for us in the forms and affordances of these interiors. Corbusier elaborates instructions for the house machine, the manual of dwelling, in which he concludes, every modern man has the mechanical sense. The feeling for mechanics exists and is justified by our daily activities. He says of the house tool, that it is essential to create the right state of mind for living in mass production houses. Um, and I will show you uh, the walk, one of the walkways at Maison La Roche. And further to my uh, argument that uh, touch as a whole body sense means that we touch every interior we enter, even if we don't actually handle anything with our hands. I'm showing you a slide that indicates that at Maison La Roche, visitors wear overshoes. So um, the touch of their feet on the floor um, is mediated not only by their shoes and socks, but also by these plastic overshoes. So we might see the same didactic, didacticism about how to inhabit interiors in Charlotte Perrion, Pierre Genere and Le Corbusier's Metal and Leather Chaise Long, LC4 of 1929, a common addition to Corbusier's domestic interiors. Although it's comfortable and adjustable, it anticipates and scripts the positions the users may adopt. The slides I'm showing you here are from the retrospective of Charlotte Perrion's work that was um, held at Fondation Louis Vuitton in Paris, uh, 2019 to 20. Not every inhabitant of Le Corbusier's house machines behaves in the way that the architects intended. A difference between the experiences of the original inhabitants of Le Corbusier's homes and today's visitors is that the smooth, shiny metals and other construction materials have accrued markers of time, patina, dust, rust and efflorescence. And these are subtle tactile reminders that when we visit Villa Savoy, were on hallowed ground in interior design terms. So visitors to the Periond exhibition that I mentioned were encouraged to sit on the furniture and experience uh, its kind of ergonomic excellence, which is how I know that the LC4 is actually comfortable. And the exhibition also showed a later uh, rendition of the chaise in bamboo. A third defining characteristic of modernism that's been important in transforming Victorian notions of home comforts are the technological developments which extended the possibilities of design in the 20th century. I'm going to consider one example, the materials we collectively term plastic. Plastic is derived from oil and like oil, it's liquid during the production process. Once solid, a plastic object can take almost any form and texture, including ones which recall its liquid phase. This makes it quite different to existing furniture construction processes and materials, even those which best approximate fluidity in appearance, such as the steamed bent wood bistro chairs manufactured by Tonnet, 1855 to 9, of which Le Corbusier wrote approvingly, or the serpentine whiplash forms of Art Nouveau fine cabinet making, or, we might say, 
the tubular metal of modernism in design, such as the chase long I've just shown you, which was also made by Gebruder Tonnet. Just as entering an interior is a kind of touch, touching the floor, touching the air, touching the handles and surfaces, so sitting is a kind of touch. Early examples of plastic to products for the interior include Charles and Ray Eames, DAR armchair, Herman Miller, 1948 to 50, where their goal was to produce an armchair from a single piece, a shell. This chair was recognized by the Museum of Modern Art in 1950. The next year, Phillips Petroleum established the polymerization of propylene. And from 1954, Giulio Natta and Carl Rain at the Politecnico di Milano developed polypropylene further in several ways. First commercially exploited by Montecatini from 1957, and sub, uh, subsequently manufacturers, including Cartel, took advantage of the properties of plastic to create new furniture forms. In 1960, Werner Panton designed the first single form injection molded plastic chair, the organic S chair. And Panton's aesthetic legacy persists, for instance, in the smooth plastic curves favoured by Egyptian Canadian designer Karim Rashid, such as his roto molded polyethylene whoopee chair of 2011. Plastic introduced new tactile experiences into the domestic interior, as I've said. In some cases, the shiny new forms that plastic enabled became the entire interior as shown in many of the room and dwelling proposals showcased in the exhibition Italy, the New Domestic Landscape at the Museum of Modern Art in 1972. And some of these ideas were put into production. Sitting on an Eames plastic chair, the sitter experiences not the responsive bounce of upholstery, but rather the small flex that this plastic affords. Production of the Eames chairs switched from fiberglass to polypropylene, and there's a discernible difference between the feel of the two materials. But in neither case does the sitter sink into an Eames chair as she would into an upholstered one. Rather, she's enclosed by it and it moves with and next to her. But as I've said, plastic is a name for a whole collection of materials which perform differently and can be made to um, behave in different ways as well. Inflatable plastic chairs, such as the blow chair, designed by Paolo Lamazzi, Donato D'Urbino and Jonathan De Paz, and produced by Zanotta from 1967, offer a sitting experience more akin to the upholstery um, that we would see in earlier interiors than the Eames shell chairs do. But they share with all plastic chairs the fact that skin sticks to them in a way that it doesn't with furnishing fabric. Sitting in an Eames chair or a blow chair feels different depending on whether the sitter is wearing trousers or a skirt, shorts or a bikini. Ingrid Halland has theorised that the blow chair is immaterial because it's inflated with air. Closely following Felicity Scott's analysis of Manfredo Tafuri's critique, Hallen suggests that plastic molded mass produced objects alienated the designer from work and increased the distance between the designer and the object. If we accept this theory, we must also recognize that plastic chairs decrease the distance between the user and the object to more or less nothing. Here, my analysis of the plastic chair focused on touch has shown that it is wholly material, whether moving with and alongside the sitter or sticking to them. In the, in the longer version of this piece of work, I then go on to examine how touch can be a useful um, focus, I don't like using sight words when I'm speaking about touch, but a useful focus um, uh, for understanding the mediation of design. And I um, think uh, 
in the in the larger piece of work about how touch is mediated uh, in design discourses um, with examples from uh, the, the, the design press, uh, design retail and museums. But um, today I'll simply conclude by saying that this uh, talk today has reflected on the importance of touch as a whole body sense, as the defining experience of interiority and as a primary medium for interior design. As I said, we touch every interior we enter, not always with our hands, but always with our bodies. When we enter interiors, they envelop us just as we consume them, they consume us. As well as the social rules and expectations which variously constrain and allow touch, tactile engagement with interiors develops over months, years and decades. We reach out and grasp a doorknob, stair rail, draw pull or light switch. When the light or our eyesight is insufficient, we feel our way around our homes using familiarity and sense memory. Touch over time is evidenced by patterns of wear, such as worn sections of floor in a heavily trafficked hall next to a kitchen counter by a bed and threadbare soft furnishings, such as chair arms that have worn away. The decisions made by interior designers and the choices we make for ourselves about the designs of our homes directly condition this tactile experience without always anticipating its effects. Thank you. Grace, thank you so much for this uh, rich presentation filled with examples and uh, the way you, yes, uh, actually put together bodily experiences, different, different types of furniture. It reminded me uh, of, um, you know, earlier uh, navigation uh, of uh, the lockdown experience uh, when uh, unaccustomed to spend so much time at home, most of the people, you know, report that they they keep on bumping into into you know furnitures at home because probably yes they had to uh, organize workspace uh, in their homes and that's why yes they had to reconsider their home space. Uh, I just wonder yes if uh, if you thought about it uh, in in this context as well. Yeah, I've had a lot of time to think about the impact of lockdown on my work, which is a project that relies on direct object handling uh, as a core part of its method. So, I mean, I had done some, a fair amount of archival research, um, persuading uh, curators to let me handle the objects that I wanted to study before lockdown occurred. But lockdown really changed uh, my project enormously. Um, partly because I wasn't able to write uh, during a period in which I was homeschooling, but also because I wasn't able to go out and handle things. And um, I could have uh, kind of embraced virtual reality and digital substitutes um, to progress my research. But after uh, considering it, I decided that those um, methods were inadequate as replacements for what I'm trying to do. Um, and I think that my project is basically a post lockdown project. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. We have a comment from uh, Ksenia. Uh, she's recently read about the visually striking constructivist furniture of Alexander Rochenko's Workers' Club, that it was quite uncomfortable to sit on. And that was on purpose to avoid a bourgeois experience of domesticity. What about Le Corbusier and other modernist designers in this respect? Did they reject bourgeois tactile comfort in a similar way? Um, I think not. I think that... Um... I mean, that's a brilliant example. I really like it. But I think that when Perry and, and Corbusier um, worked on their furniture, they were they were trying to create comfortable furniture. And, and 
definitive furniture, in fact, the, the uh, furniture to end all furniture, the only furniture you might ever need. And when um, I was able to lie on the chaise long at the Fondation Louis Vuitton, I was expecting it to be uncomfortable and was very surprised at how comfortable it was. It, it's obviously akin to, um, I think it's akin to medical furniture, like a dental, dentist's chair, in that it seems to have um, a utilitarian um, stance that might not privilege comfort, but in fact, comfort is part of its utility and therefore is accommodated. Thank you. Do we have any comments, questions? Okay, I'm checking. Uh, and I'm also checking our YouTube stream, which yes, so I'm multitasking <laughs> somehow. But it's also, yes, it's also interesting uh, when you said about this personal experience of sitting uh, in that chaise longue. Yes, because it happens very much uh, and very often with uh, fashion historians uh, with who believe that uh, some something you know must be uncomfortable because it looks uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It requires one to actually try it on to understand uh, what. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I feel I feel I feel a bit of sympathy for fashion historians in that regard because one of the things that that um, has been a little bit painful for me in doing my research is that. Um, when an object enters a museum, if it's clothing, it's never worn again. If it's jewellery, it's never worn again. And obviously different museums have different policies and I have had more kind of liberated uh, um, experiences in certain archives. But for instance, at the Victoria and Albert Museum, I was able to handle rings but not put them on my fingers. So I could handle them in, in not any way except the one intended, but in some ways except the one intended. And, um, I, you know, there's, there's no way that you could ever um, put on historic clothing that's in that collection. However, you know, you would be able to um, collect it on the market on the secondary market and uh, develop a handling collection of your own and obviously museums and archives have handling collections as well yeah, true and such such a gap uh, between handling and actual actual wearing yes yeah, yeah. okay uh, so yeah it seems like uh, those who have comments and questions uh, you can uh, use our chat box, which I think is a yeah, very nice space, which substitutes a little bit uh, coffee breaks. Uh, Grace, thank you so much again for this fantastic contribution. So great to have you here with us today. And uh, we are moving and I'm um, handling this privilege of uh, chairing this panel to my uh, colleague, uh, Irina Sirotkina. Uh, who is uh, with us today. Uh, Irina is a researcher uh, at the Institute for the History of Science and Technology. And uh, she's, uh, yes, she's a researcher into movement and body. And one of her publications, one, well, some publications include The Sixth Sense of the Avant-Garde Dance Movement and Kinesthesia in the Lives of Artists and Poets and uh, recent uh, the dance uh, experience of understanding. I hope I'm right, uh, you know, translating uh, from Russian. Irina, please. Uh, yes, hello, hello. It's, um, uh, it's, it's an honor for me to be with you uh, this morning, um, this afternoon. Uh, and uh, basically, my, my duty is very ungrateful one. I have to hire you up because we, we have a for two, two hours for six uh, papers, and each of uh, is wonderful, is, is, is worth a discussion, a long discussion, but we are very short of time and we have to finish at uh, half past two Moscow time sharp, because uh, to leave some uh, time for a break for us to have a lunch break or whatever break we, we can afford. So um, I uh, ask uh, the speakers to keep uh, to 
15 minutes of presentation and then we have uh, a few minutes for uh, questions and discussions okay and i will uh, um, please excuse me uh, because i will remind you um, when you have two minutes left and one minute left so i, I will be interrupting you and i uh, beg your pardon for this so we um, have um, the first speaker who's with us Yuzi Merrifield from uh, Solent University Southampton uh, how can using familiar DNA data provide an emotive sense of our human connection using creative transdisciplinary practice? A question mark. Please, Susie. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just share my screen. Please let me know that you can see it. Um, can you see the screen now? Great. Uh, I can, can, yes, thank you, Susie. But can you uh, make it the full screen, please? Can you enter the? Yes, great. Thank you. Right. Okay. So, connection, identity, human. Good morning. So I'm Susie Merrifield and I'm a postgraduate researcher and associate lecturer at Southampton Salem University in the south of England. Thank you so much for the exciting opportunity to talk to you all today about my research conducted on my project entitled The Human Cascade. My interest in the intersection of STEAM, science, technology, education, art and math only became apparent recently during my master's research into using positionality as a critical research tool. My father was a main board director at the Wellcome Foundation until his retirement in 1995, and my mother can colour match without having the original swatch to hand. Cultural geographer Ian Cook wrote about the concept of positionality, suggesting that the researcher could include themselves into their research using their own voice and those of other critics to make analysis. My personal position provides the audience with a framework from which my research can be viewed. Scientists and sociologists such as Robert Pluman with his 2019 book Blueprint informs us that there is data proving that our interests are passed down through DNA to future generations. As a trained textile designer, I've often looked to science for inspiration for my design ideas. I am Susie Merrifield, and the image on the right of the slide is a visualisation of 0.013% of my DNA. The research question I wanted to address throughout this project was how can using familial DNA data provide an emotive sense of our human connection using creative transdisciplinary practice? Throughout my research, I used post-digital human-centred methodology. The term post-digital has been taken from Mel Alexenberg's 2013 book, The Future of Art in a Post-Digital Age, from Hellenistic to Hebraic Consciousness. It's a term which addresses the fact that transdisciplinary art practice has become more concerned with what it means to be human than what it means to be digital. Our identity is written in the molecular text of DNA, and with the rapid, fast-paced technological advancements, society is re-evaluating its role in what it means to be human. My methodology combined three transdisciplinary threads of art, biology and technology, embracing a common language to produce fertile ground for innovation, new perspectives on important questions. Claudia Schnag, an independent researcher and curator at the intersection of these three transdisciplinary areas, wrote within her book, Creating Art Science Collaborations, individuals who constantly cross boundaries, disciplinary boundaries can build bridges, use the experience from different fields for their own work, foster the exchange of information between them and initiate valuable experiments or extraordinary projects. This is exactly what I wanted to achieve, bringing key sociological and scientific contemporary research outside of the science labs and display it as immersive and emotive works to the wider population, taking ownership of my own and familial DNA with consent away from the privatised company it is stored within. In a world where the last year has been unrecognisable with a global pandemic, the need to connect with each other is a need we feel more now than ever before. 
We share 99.9% .9 of our DNA with every single human being on the planet. Downloading and analyzed DNA from Ancestry.com takes up 12,305 printable A4 pages. It is only around 23 and a half of these pages which makes us unique. In cultural terms, DNA findings in 2021 are a really contentious subject. DNA analysis can connect individuals with family members so that they can build family trees and build loving relationships. However, it can also enforce socially constructed boundaries. Researcher and Professor Jerome de Groot mentions within his paper, DNA Art, that DNA is a metonymic for a wider set of discussions about ethics, politics, migration, biopolitics and identity. DNA Art becomes a way of thinking about much wider and more problematic concerns, a long way away from the hyper-commodified personal genetic portraits but also somehow part of the same continuum. Derecka Pennell, a black American woman and social movement lawyer who writes for the British newspaper, The Guardian, talked about DNA analysis from her own perspective. She says, black people are particularly vulnerable. Our DNA is disproportionately collected, stored, planted, and used against us in criminal proceedings. Handing over such intimate information heightens the risks for abuse. With the horrific death of George Floyd just three months after this article was written, Hernell's concerns were clearly valid. Drawing from the works of Michael Forcourt and Giorgio Gambin, there is no such thing as a true race. We are all connected. Due to the contentious nature of biological surveillance, with privatised company owning our DNA, companies which have high stakes in health insurance, we are only realising now the huge impact DNA has as a cultural commodity. Critiquing my bias, I'm very aware that I'm writing this paper as a privileged white British woman. When you send your DNA off to a sequencing company such as Ancestry.com or 23andMe, computational algorithms stereotype individuals into boxes of ethnic groups based on our genetic markings. There are four key theorists whose work has underpinned my research. Firstly, Pierre Bourdais, the opposition and differences inscribed in the symbolic marking of sameness can materially shape the body in ways which contribute to social inequalities and difference. Secondly, Mela Luxemburg has spoken about earlier, moving beyond creating art for individuals to experience from a distance in awesome silence, artists in our post-digital age are creating new forms, emphasizing our essential interconnectedness rather than our separateness forms invoking the feeling of belonging to a larger whole rather than expressing the isolated, alienated self. Thirdly, Roland Barthes' theory on semiotics was used within the aesthetics of my installation piece, providing the audience with new signs, a new visual text in which to attach cultural, social and personal meanings. Fourthly, Donna Haraway looks at the body as a blank page for social inscriptions. A finding within my research in sequencing the six members of my biological family was that we were not all sequenced along the same individual DNA positions. One member had extra positions which the other did not and vice versa. Therefore, I had to delete these specific positions from each individual's DNA code to ensure that we were being compared along the right lines. To link my practice to theory, Donna Haraway talks about the splitting on the self and how we can only view the world from partial rather than wholly objective perspectives. It made me think about my design and how in order to judge the design equally along the same positions, neither individual will be totally whole. The image on the right of the screen is a familial member whose design needed to be split and shuffled down so that all familial members could be judged equally along the same DNA positions. A quote from Donna Haraway's book mentions the split and contradictory self is the one who can interrogate positionings and be accountable, the one who can construct and join rational conversations and fantastic imaginings that change history. My research aims to pattern a creative narrative with DNA, using the DNA iconography as a storytelling text, enabling the audience to read the body without the body being present. The intention is to design an emotive sense of belonging to our ancestors 
having their DNA passed down and living within you as a form of post-digital embalming. As our biological cartography, DNA is the result of, and in emotive terms, the cultural human narrative and embrace of our ancestral history. My work aims to remind the audience of their own uniqueness as individuals, yet to join in celebration of how similar our DNA patterns are to each other as a human race. The audience will be able to view the connections within the data shown between family members amongst my practical piece, as well as know that we connect in some way to every single human on the planet, deconstructing the socially constructed boundaries we are often placed within. Shown here is the Sandra DNA sequencing technique used by scientists to visualize DNA. It is also the technique which Ancestry.com uses. It has two outputs. On the left in gray is a separation done in gel. Each horizontal line is a base and as you move upwards from the bottom, the next line is the next base in the sequence. The color graph on the right is another output of Sandra sequencing. Automated sequencing can be done where a fluorescent output can be measured by a computer and then put into a graph. The different bases show different color fluorescence which the computer records, each peak representing the next base in the sequence. As a trained knitwear designer, I knew my limitations on my hand-operated industrial knitting machine and decided to use a needle placement technique to create the Sandra separation technique like the image in grey on the left. What fascinated me while producing my design was how directly my unique DNA sequence looked like a strand of DNA, the spiral staircase of my life. My practice will continue this trajectory of bringing the gap, bridging the gap between science and contemporary social and cultural issues, highlighting the importance of ancestral DNA to my personal familial connections, but also to humanity as a whole. This will enable new audiences to be involved in viewing and participating in current transdisciplinary research. Analysis of the rest of my family revealed the considerable variations between us. For example, my children are not as genetically close to each other, sharing 2,266 centimetres of DNA, as my brother and I, who share 2,373. I also share five centimetres more DNA with my youngest son than my oldest, and I'm genetically closer by 24 centimetres to my father than my mother. It is these figures that really inspired me to think about the advancements in the debate between biological essentialism and social construction. Looking at biopolitics, ethics, and the potential for new forms of classification, I was quite aware that I was bringing the outside of the the inside of the body outside and what would be the ethical considerations of wearing your inner identity on the outside of your body? What vulnerabilities would I expose? What am I exposing now in 2021 that I don't have the science yet to understand? It brings about new systems of power and the potential for new forms of classification. In 2020, I chose to illustrate my research in the form of a sculptural installation, showing six mannequins, each representing a familial member. Each mannequin wore a garment that was designed using the data taken from 0.013% of the member's DNA. There is my mother and father, my brother and myself, and my two children, showing the flow of ancestral DNA filtering down through the generations. Here's my video now.
Producing my six metre high sculpture installation was a challenge in itself. Before the lights and sound came on, the anticipation reminded me very much of what Walter Benjamin describes as the threat of the shock. Connecting the mannequins to each other via LEDs to demonstrate the DNA being passed down through generations felt a little unnerving to see and nod towards the contentious nature of biological data exposure. I found it really interesting that although we are all connected to our mothers when we are born via the umbilical cord, to see my family all connected within my installation brought about a slightly dystopian feeling, reminding me of Neo being plugged in within the 1999 film, The Matrix. In cultural terms, DNA analysis affects many different issues relating to human connection. There are the issues surrounding the lack of variation understood with African genomes, and the fear that many black people have with analysing their ancestry in terms of the slave trade, but also the suspicion that it will be used to further classify and reinforce socially constructed boundaries. Another concern is that personality trait analysis will follow the same route as the contentious racial boundaries, and this may become another field of classification which health insurers and pharmaceutical companies can capitalise on. To conclude and taking this project further, I look forward to seeing bigger displays of human connection where audience members, possibly including those who have no familial members of their own, feel connected to others regardless of the racial, sexual, cultural labours we place ourselves within and connect as one human body, one human race, we connect. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Susie, for keeping to time as well. And uh, it's it's um it's an artist talk, in fact. It's more than just an academic paper. It's an artist talk, and uh, your installation looks very very interesting. W where uh, was it uh, made? Which well, it's actually it my my master's research. So um, I finished my master's during lockdown, so I only had two weeks where I could I could book. Um, the TV studios in the university, and um, I teach there as well, so I had a little bit of, uh, you know, a leeway to try and get that in. And then um, it, it was uh, it was a big project. Um, the mannequins broke. It was all a little bit, all a little bit scary getting it up. But uh, but yes, it was. I really hope to exhibit soon. Good. And and how how did your family react to it? Oh, they loved it. They loved it. So luckily my mother was able to come and my children were able to come to it. But uh, obviously, because it was in the middle of lockdown, um, there, wouldn't, there wasn't really anybody else allowed to come. But uh, they, they loved it. And I think um, my father said, possibly in the future, um, you know, he'd like to see how his DNA can be used for, for more transdisciplinary research. So, um, it's exciting. I'm really looking forward to possibly taking this further with a um, doctorate. Well, uh, we have, uh, thank you. We have a, a couple of minutes for questions and I, I see in, in uh, the chat box, uh, thanks, uh, fantastic work, fascinating. Thank you so much. But perhaps there are also some questions from the audience. Well, if, if not, I. Um, I, I can't see at the moment. Please raise your hands. Um, if uh, if I can see, I'll ask. But uh, uh, just one more question from me. Um, the DNA is um, uh, a part of identity in, in the criminal sense of the term, the criminal investigator uh, sense of the term. That they, if, if it were uh, to be a criminal investigation, uh, like one, one of the pictures mentioned that we have lots of databases uh, uh, formed for black people and uh, much uh, fewer for white people. Um, if it were indeed the identity, um, what, what does it really show? The, the identity of, um, in the family, let's say, because you know the methodology. Uh, it seems the same, but it's not really the same. Uh, when you you identify somebody as a criminal and you identify family ties. So you're asking me what exactly I identify in in my work, right? Well, because I'm only doing 0.013% um, that's printed over the top and the back of the garments. Um, it's not enough to identify an individual. Um, so you do really have to be careful with how you store your DNA. Yeah. 
Okay, thank, thank you very much, Susie. And um, uh, I, yes? Yes, I can see there is a question. There is a, uh, a hand, Irina. Oh, please, go ahead. Hello colleagues, I really liked your project and I have a question to the artist. Didn't you want to create a series of uh, DNA portraits and maybe have your own auto portrait of the DNA? Thank you. No, no, actually there, there is translation. Susie, are you following? Uh, no, I'm afraid I don't understand um, what that was. Um, the thing I'm that, afraid. Well, just, just for the future, uh, in the globe, uh, the globe icon, uh, you need to choose uh, English. Uh, okay. But yes, we need to. We have to translate the question. Well, I can translate. I think Irina, Irina's question was about the, the. It was a suggestion to make a portrait gallery, or on the basis of DNA, if I understand it correctly. A podcast. Great, yes, definitely. I'm up for um, everything. I'm going to really try. There's a portrait, portrait gallery, and okay. auto portrait as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. My hearing, I'm hard of hearing, so <laughs> thank you very much. That sounds great. Thank, thank you, Susie. And uh, we're moving on to uh, Olga Weinstein. Um, paper, uh, Olga Weinstein uh, teaches, is professor at Russian State University for the Humanities in Moscow, and uh, her title is Intangible Fashion from Virtual Fitting Rooms to Digital Clothing. Olga, please. Uh, 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 Hello, everyone. I'm really glad uh, to uh, see all the participants. I'm going to begin with my presentation. Ola, while you're sharing your screen, I'm going to say that there is interpretation again. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, our English speaking participants, please, uh, on the lower uh, panel, uh, you see on the right uh, globe icon. To follow uh, Russian speakers, please choose English channel. There will be translation available for you. I hope it works. Okay, sorry. Yeah. All right, then. I think I'm ready to begin. I think everybody can see the presentation. No, not really. We don't see anything. Just a second. Can you see it now? I'm starting to share my screen. Nothing so far, unfortunately. Oh. Let me try again. So here we are. Great. Just one more second. Let me launch it again. You need to open the presentation and share your screen. I think it was opened. You need to close it, and then open again and share your screen. Let me try again. All right, here is the presentation. Talk. Mm 
Так, вот сейчас, значит, я делаю второй раз. All right, let me do it again. Так, вот сейчас видно? Да, да, сейчас хорошо. Uh -huh. Можно uh, full screen, пожалуйста? Да. Uh -huh. Так, сейчас видно, да? Uh -huh. Так, хорошо. Значит, э, э, ну вот э, э, тема, которую я выбрала, неосязаемая мода. The topic I chose today is the intangible fashion. I'm going to talk about digital clothes in different versions. This is a new topic, not just for me, but I think for many of the of those listening to me too. And although we are used to thinking that this is a phenomenon of the past, let's say, two years. I want to show today the background. I want to share the history of digital fashion. And I would say that this is a trend that has its own stance already in fashion. I'm going to talk today about digital clothes, what it is, how it is created. It is created, it is designed mostly in 3D programs like does 3d there are schools uh, which teach this kind of 3d modeling uh, digital clothes is a product of um, computer graphics and it can be quite realistic or it can be quite utopian or quite far from reality like here and um it is also can it also can be commercialized for example online stores offer the option of uh, trying on their clothes digitally. This is one of that example. This is called Replicant, this platform. Another marketplace, Uber's X, could serve as an example too. This is what it looks like for the user. They choose a digital look, then they add it to the basket, and the user has to upload their photo, of course. There are special requirements, technical requirements uh, to the photo that has to be uploaded. Like uh, the hair cannot cover the face, and there should be enough light in the picture. Then this picture is sent to a designer or to the marketplace. And then the user gets by email this kind of a digital look. Here you can see uh, the before and after photos. Sometimes what can also be created is a digital 3D double for the user and this replica is used uh, for further tryings of clothes. This is the digital service and here is how it works. Here you can see different options of different software. And in the last column, you can see ours because uh, this image is produced by, by one of software developers. They believe that they are best, um, they offer the best quality. What amazes me is how the digital clothes is described on these platforms. This dress by Regina Turbina is described in the following way. This dress is made 
from metal with inserts from pure light. So we can see uh, how metaphorical this language is, and we can also witness how the marketing rhetoric evolves for this kind of clothes. The language itself, I would say, uses quite traditional tools. When people speak about the digital fashion, they say that this is extremely sustainable environmental fashion because it allows one to cut the expenses. First of all, the expenses for the physical on the physical production. And also it enables one to store prototypes for future collections. Very often they are collaborations. This is a collaboration by Puma and Regina Turbina. And the text that you can see here on the slide is authored by the designer. Uh, it is part of the anti-gravity collection. We have already had talks uh, during this conference about digital technologies. What I'm interested in here is this kind of new statics which emerges in digital fashion. This is one of the collaboration Buffalo and Dress X. These are sneakers that are on flame. Here you can see the flame and the sneakers, and the sneakers are in the process of their destruction because of the fire. Natalia Banova gathered a lot of interesting brands on this platform. And sometimes uh, they authored by designers. This is the replicant marketplace. This is an image designed by the artificial intelligence. So this is a product by software, not by a human being. And now I would say that the AI is competing with human designers. Taking into account the topic of our today, today's conference, I would like to focus on the tactile aspect of um, uh, digital clothes. This is a brand titled Unhuman. You can see um, these inserts made from artificial fur which have this inviting feel that feel like something soft. And I believe that it's not by accident. These fragments are not by accident here. And I would like to quote Maurice Merleau-Ponty here, Visible and Invisible, 1968. One and the same body sees and touches uh, the visible and the touchable belongs to one and the same dimension, and the visual experience includes the experience of touch, and on the contrary, the touch relies on the vision. And I think that Ponti here introduces a very significant term for us, the tactile visuality. And he tries to offer arguments all the time that this haptic visuality emerges um, because of the joint work of tactility and vision, which happens for people who wear clothes because uh, people who wear the clothes feel the touch of the clothes and at the same time can see these clothes 
on their own body. And this look, this clothes is also seen by third party observers, those who see the person from a side. And what happens next is that the observers uh, take a thought experience of trying to imagine what this clothes feels like, trying to try on these sensations. And this is a rhyme between the touch and the visual has long been used. This is, for example, an advertising piece by the Yella, a traditional UK brand. We can see that touch is central here. As tender with baby as you are to attend a touch or this advertising of wool blankets. Uh, evidently, these are the blankets that are chosen for the future bride uh, as a kind of a fortune, as a trousseau for the girl. And we can see that she relies heavily on touch while choosing the trousseau. Again, blankets, worn and bull. Again, here we can see the aesthetization of the touch and uh, the touch made visible in the image. When we, uh, when contemporary designers uh, work with digital clothes. And here I'm using an image from Maria Shevchenko's presentation shown at a recent conference about digital fashion held by Ludmila, hosted by Ludmila Mersavan. Maria Shevchenko, a visualization professional, explained how he, she manages to get this kind of tactile effect in her visualizations. She also said that as a designer, she aims to show what it feels like. So to the left, you can see a visualization made by a professional. We can see a lot more details compared to the right hand image, which is made by an amateur. we can see the material, we can see what the material feels like. And what is very important, uh, the 3D model can simulate the fabric in motion. You can see the folds, you can see the creases, you can see how the fabric moves. So what we get here is indeed a 3D effect. And we get an illusion of volume, an illusion of 3D vision. What is also important is that here they work not only just with a realistic image, but they also create an illusion of uh, the fabric that is worn or the fabric that is rumpled, even here to the left, the image is much less clean, so to speak, because it is very important, as Marie said, it's very important for her to show the real kind of work. So for example, here she shows the sewer and you can see uh, the threads basically. So the realistic vision, the, uh, the realism of this image is reached by uh, the imperfections, the imperfections are added. So this kind of poetry of imperfections is in high demand now, so to speak. It's very convincing. 
here I would like to quote Sunlight Infractions, a project which provided a lot of arguments to support the fact that on our today's century, when we are trying to reach their perfection, we actually need imperfection as uh, the human dimension. We can remember deconstructivism in fashion as a uh, kind of a way out of this extreme perfection. And I think that these small imperfections added in 3D modeling are also part of the same trend. Designers of digital fashion try to take all of this into account and they try to convey all of these real life imperfections now i'm switching to the final part of my presentation what is the aesthetics of this digital fashion one would think that digital fashion is about complete freedom and designers very often turn to this kind of um, space-like or cosmic fashion. And um, very many designers try to be as creative as possible. If we take a look at other digital platforms, we will see that many designers just reproduce in the virtual reality, their usual style. These are images, for example, of Aliona Akmadulina's virtual design. These are copies of what she does physically. So she doesn't really employ the uh, possibilities of the digital fashion. Or here is a dress by Alexander Terukov, who specializes in cocktail dresses or evening dresses. Here he just reproduces his own style. So basically what they do here is just a reproduction of what they do offline, but in another media. There are other examples too, they are examples. Here is a Kandinsky dress, which I wanted to share, which allows one to try on the constructivism aesthetics sometimes paintings are used for example a collection inspired by painting here at uh, tatiana romantseva's prints are used against the background of classical paintings Sorry, Olga, uh, you have already used 20 minutes. Yeah, this is fine. Uh, this is my last slide. These are space dresses, which are demonstrated on these platforms. And this is the very last image that I'm going to share. These are shoes. Also as an option of digital fashion, Iliador of Chain's design. And finally, I wanted to ask a question. Is it true that the digital fashion is the fashion of the future? Here we can see Alona Hall's avatar. Uh, 
And here is the digital show by Hanifa. Here we can see no avatars even. Their fashion show, or their catwalk show, had only clothes. Frankly speaking, it produces an eerie impression on me personally. But I think this is an important point that fashion now is really entering the virtual, the online space and reclaims the privileges of other creative um, arts, uh, also tactility and the haptic feeling. The um, technical progress is unavoidable and um, it enables the visuality to encompass all um, the possibilities of other senses. I think this is the logic of the civilization development. And we can't avoid the high-tech future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olga. Let's see where the civilization goes. The thing is that we are lagging behind by 15 minutes. So I suggest that you ask your questions in the chat if this is OK, or if uh, we will have um, more time later on, we can return to questions. Now we would like to share an article about uh, texture in avant-garde uh, for Olga Weinstein, if she doesn't know it. Yeah, I will be happy to answer questions if you uh, write them in the chat. Yes, uh, sure. I suggest that you use the chat uh, for questions. So the next talk, Irina Balakshina, the High School of Economics, High School of Design, fashion exhibition versus online space. You're most welcome. Hello. I'm very happy to see all of you. Just a second, I will share my presentation. Can you see it? Yeah, we can. Thank you. My talk is closely connected to the previous one. I want to talk about the tactile experience of the audience using the example of a fashion exhibition and online space. And I want to consider uh, the tactile sense uh, from the point of view of a fashion user. So what journey do they go through, through the uh, direct kinesthetic perception, through observing the fashion at the distance at fashion exhibi exhibitions, to uh, looking at virtual clothes in the virtual space. I'm going to talk about uh, haptic kinesthesia. And we all know that there must not necessarily be a direct connection between our tactile perception and the object. And examples are, for example, our own perception in the space or feeling the touch at a distance. The example in the example with the glove, as we can see here in the example, we feel not just the material of the glove, but also something we touch. So what happens is a double touch, touching the object and touching the glove. And the result is that we can perceive either the object that we come in touch with and the absence of the object and other, other um, elements of it. The body is a special phenomenon. We um, can say that the uh, body boundaries are blurred through touch. We do not just passively absorb information, but we also lead through a certain shared experience. We are part of an immersive experience. We're immersed in a particular environment. To touch means to define the boundaries of myself and the other. And at the same time, the touch 
enables us to blow this boundary or even get rid of it. The ear background serves as the um, serves as the background we read the bodies against. The hands can manipulate different objects and redefine their textures. Very often, uh, researchers draw a parallel between um, the vision and the tact tactility. So it seems that these two senses are interconnected, but vision enables us to go beyond ourselves, while the embodied experience is um, the immediate coexistence with the world. So when we emphasize every particular sense, we change our perspective, we change our perception. Now we'd like to say a couple of words about what audiences pay attention to when they come to an exhibition. First of all, there is a certain distance between an exhibit and the the audience and the body boundaries overlap uh, with the object at a completely different point. So this space coexists with the distance that one has to um, keep at an exhibition. I would like to share the theory of Pierre Olaf Fargera's Fargera, Norwegian aesthetician who believes that how fast we process the stimuli influences our perception. So the faster we can process an image, the more beautiful it seems to us. Here are the five characteristics that we can read as fast as possible. Symmetry, proportions, uh, contrast, brightness, and the golden section. Uh, this is why I I draw a conclusion that the costume uh, is the perfect exhibit for um, to be displayed because we can see all of these elements at once. So when we see at an exhibition a corset, a 19th century corset, we can feel the compression by the corset in our own body. So it means uh, that an exhibition of, of fashion does not require any additional comments. It's very important to build a special sensitive images at an exhibition. These senses are born only in co-creation together with the audiences. Some of the audiences' reactions can be predefined by images themselves. At an exhibition, three embodiments interact the body of the author, uh, the body of the art piece, and the body of the audience. The uh, clothes that we see on a mannequin is uh, an imitation of the performative um, wearable clothes. It's an imitation of a catwalk. But uh, th through using the space, one could create a, a really massive exhibition. Now I would like to quote Martin Mangiella's work for Her Hermé. And I would like to show uh, the view on tactility and comfort. He paid special attention to the material that the clothes is made from, uh, cashmere, silk, and uh, wool. And it's very important how he worked on the finishing. He worked with fur, uh, with leather. He designed new ways, a new weave for his clothes. So it's all very important uh, for the design. Very often, special textures have associations in our minds. For example, soft is feminine, uh, leather is masculine. Simplicity is associated yet with something else. Uh, it is the and, and other associations have to deal with temperatures. We, we come to think that the colder color, color is a colder in touch. The image of an object also has to suggest what kind of contact they're calling for. And more uh, interesting show was held in 20. 
17, it uh, shows the style of Hermes and their own uh, brand, um, Margelle. They have color zoning, while signifies Margiela, while the red symbolizes Hermes. The exhibition began with uh, the uh, compliments uh, given to women and uh, there was an audio recording as well as the video recordings of models. This audio visual uh, track uh, sort of provides the immersive experience for the viewer. One more interesting exhibition is uh, was done by Ren Makubo. It was held at Metropolitan Art Museum. There is a small video from this exhibition. It is really different from the previous one. There is the white space here, so that nothing would distract the viewer from the dresses, so that they can really engage uh, with the exhibition. The basic idea here is to show uh, the fringe area where fashion and art meet. The mutually exclusive notions uh, is the title of this exhibition. So there are these dichotomies as subject and object, and there are the distances or the uh, gaps where they meet. Rekwa Kuba has an uh, intuitive approach to making costumes for her some uh, gaptic qualities uh, of clothes were important in her collection, The Future of Silhouettes. Uh, she made a dress that looked like a, a piece of paper that was squeezed. In the next uh, collection, Body Meets Dress, She blurs the borders between the clothes and an object. She often creates some uh, works that remind more of sculpture. She transforms uh, the body through elements uh, in the body. She, uh, for instance, here she abandoned the use of sleeves and uh, that uh, in a way, challenges the perception of clothes. Another collection by Den Rose, she counterposes colors as the symbols of something uh, happy and something sad. But what interest is interested, what is interesting here? What does she want to get across in her works? What does she want the audience to feel? She elaborates the user scenarios and she implements them in her clothes. As for exhibition, quite often they are accompanied uh, by a video from her salon or one more interesting exhibition by Balenciaga, where they exhibited the X-ray prints made by an artist, Nick Schwitz, in 2016. We can see not only a dress, but what is inside it, which broadens our perception of the dress. The exhibition might be supplied with installations, with interactive areas where one can touch the dress. And now I'm going to speak about digital fashion. Olga Weinstein has spoken about it quite extensively, but I'm just going to draw some conclusions that I'm interested in. Yes, right now the body is moving to the virtual space. When we use the VR technologies, we can interact with object not only by touching it, but uh, with our whole body so that we can easily create the presence effect and ensure better communication with the viewer. 
and the audience. I'm uh, here, I'm showing some digital stores of digital clothes that exist in Russia. There are the replicant website, there is the dress picks website. And the next, on the next slide, I'm going to show how I myself uh, tried such a costume. It was the costume that you saw at Olga's uh, slide, on Olga's slide, and it was uh, a costume that I uh, found on a Telegram bot where you can, at the replicant website, there you need to make a picture with a good with good lightning well i had a good photo that i took at a yoga class i chose uh, this costume that you can see the service itself of course is not a perfect the fabric doesn't seem to touch the body everywhere nicely it is not suited nicely but it was a free of uh, charge so um, the quality of course is not perfect but still this combination seems to look interesting online it is a lot more difficult to transmit and communicate uh, some senses and uh, physical perception we can uh, have the feeling of uh, the movement and space and uh, this is something that is used in the digital clothing because here the costume moves around and I think that what you could could have seen in uh, Olga's per, um, in Olga's presentation where you saw catwalks and other kinds of movement that allowed you to see how this costume performs how this outfit performs in space but still there is a question that remains open what experience do we want to communicate would that be what would the user experience be what be the experience of the viewer at the exhibition and what the experience of designer of digital clothes would be I think this is an important question that we should ask at this stage. My own conclusion was that an exhibition is a somewhat a border space between uh, the reality of the material and the irreality of the virtual. So it is a sort of intermediate stage. Thank you very much. Irina, thank you. Thank you for giving us some time for a discussion so that we can ask you a question and we can uh, talk to other speakers. Unfortunately, you couldn't see everything. We couldn't see everything for technical reasons, but thanks to Olga Weinstein, I, we already know what you meant. I, as your supervisor, would like you to develop the theoretical aspect of perceiving the beauty and the six parameters, the symmetry and proportionality, so that you could come to an idea at the end that we have our own laws for perceiving the beautiful. Now we have to, may I still, as I have a couple of minutes, I would like to make a small comment on my presentation and the previous presentation as for the digital clothes, whether it is a step into the future. To me, it seems to be one of the methods, nothing more. It's a way to show catwalks. It's a way to uh, let people try clothes on. 
and then it can also help us print out uh, the models. So I wouldn't think uh, that it is a threat. I think it's an interesting experience. Now, whereas uh, a, a response to a concern voiced by Olga Weinstein, Rina, thank you very much uh, for reassuring us. And I am going to give the floor to Ksenia Gusarova from, our, from the Russian I, unfortunately, I had only the English variant of uh, this talk, but she's from the Russian Humanitarian Institute, and uh, you heard the title. So do you see my presentation? Lady colleagues, I'm glad to be with you. Thanks to the organizers. I should have made this talk a year ago, but uh, something went wrong. And I hope that I'm going to touch upon the issue of tactility. And as one of, uh, it's an important part of the project that I'm doing for the norms of posing for photographs. And these are the instructions that you can find in Instagram and maybe you yourself know how to use these techniques or you had a visual experience of uh, reading these guidelines. Quite often uh, there are the right poses to be taken and the wrong ones. So that if you stick to keeping a good position, that means that you're going to make a beautiful picture and that uh, your image and look will look interesting and other people will like it. My today talk would deal mostly with something that is opposed to this norm. I'm going to speak about some negative looks or images uh, that uh, we might think about. It might come up in our mind. So, if, for instance, uh, one terrible thing is a thick hand or thick arm in the photo. So I found some sort of a parody or the fake uh, guidelines for posing for Instagram. And it was rather humorous. And since uh, there are some mock guidelines, uh, it shows that there is uh, an importance that is attached to it in our society. So here on this picture, you see a citation. It says danger, a thick arm is uh, like a nightmare. It pursues a girl everywhere where she goes, even if she's really thin. So it is a virtual body that is not anyhow connected to our real body. And uh, this link is something that emerges on the surface of the image. This body can also be a starting point for us. Let's not dwell too much on the mock examples. Now I'm going to give you a real example that is an English source, it's called Imogen Lambert. So here I'm citing a piece that uh, shows how important it is not to have a thick arm. So these are very typical images on the technique of placing arms so that they separate 
from the body and what happens to the body. The body is fragmented. It is not uh, perceived as a whole volume. It should consist of uh, elements that are very elaborate. The bloggers and photographers are saying that there should be some air into the image there should be air in the hands uh, between the legs maybe around the neck something that comes from ballet maybe so there should be this empty spaces around the contours of the figure all these tricks are aiming at having this optical illusion as something that is made that something that is that takes place due to the camera because it takes out the most dense part uh, so that we have to do something to counteract the effects of the camera to make the image more elaborate to make it thinner sl more slender so we should trim down the figure in a way to frame it in a way that it would be more palatable. This comes from a French blog by Alain Dapel. There are some advices that she gives to her audience. So you shouldn't uh, take pictures in a straight pose. It's better to do them by the sides in the profile. We might think that it is uh, something only about uh, being thin or being overweight. But it's not only that. I think there is the concept of the grotesque body elaborated by Bakhtin that we could use. What is not recommended as well is also to turn in such a way so that a nose would cross the contour of your cheek. If you've never thought about it, I think this is a very surprising idea but I actually see how visually the nose is elongated when it crosses the line, the cheek line. So it's not only the ideal of being thin, it is also an ideal of having right proportions. So there is an idea of a norm of restriction, and why I'm applying to Bakhtin here, because he had two kinds of corporate. So there was the grotesque body, and I wanted to uh, remind what is opposed to it. It's the bodily canon, which is the new bodily canon that is uh, tied to the high culture uh, and to noble and aristocratic circles. This body is uh, restricted. It's shown from the outside. It doesn't mix with anything else. It's something, and everything that comes out of this body, something that breaks its unity, everything that takes out of the bodies and takes into another body, something that should be closed off. This plane of the body becomes very important as the border between this body and the world of the personality. We can see manifold examples in posing guidebooks. The contour of the body should also be separate from the body itself. It should be separated from the background, from other people. So this focus 
of on individuality is transferred through the image everything that sticks out of the body anything that doesn't fit anything that is too elongated uh, we can see uh, some of the examples on in these guidebooks as as well as in the picture with the nose that i've just shown the new bodily canon is a visual canon and it's development and proliferation has an interest in dynamics in the 17th century it was uh, part of the court culture but nowadays it has become almost mainstream as we can see from the posing guidelines making a stress or emphasizing the visuality of an image it seems to show that our body from the 3d format turns into a 2d so the lines the folds uh, the curves are very important and uh, there is this shape that is 2d shape it's a flat shape the touch is something that becomes absolutely invisible. And the example given by Rina Palakshana, when we can see the touch in a hand that is wearing a glove, you can feel the textile and the surface of this glove, but there is actually no pressing against the skin. Why? Because in these guidebooks on posing, uh, there should never be a movement. You should never really do something. You should have uh, only a hint at the movement, not performing the movement itself. You should not really uh, touch anything. You should not uh, touch a cheek. You should not touch uh, your chest. So there is this very sensual accent, but it becomes very visual and it's sort of excludes tactility, at least for the person that you see in the picture. But one more idea that I wanted to express is the idea of reversing the system of Martin. For him, the older pattern is this grotesque body and it's being superseded by the new bodily canon that I myself would like to stress that the grotesque body is produced by the new bodily canon, or maybe it is even a later phenomena. And I think it is sort of even produced by these guidebooks. I would like to remind a very interesting uh, to tell uh, to quote an interesting piece uh, from uh, Mary Douglas where she speaks about the cleanliness and danger. So dirt is uh, something that is produced by an attempt to bring something into order. So in a way, this systematizing of uh, the matter is uh, something that produces the elements that, that don't fit into the system. The grotesque body for me is something that is produced by the development of this, the practice of the new bodily canon. And then the high culture and mass culture reject this byproduct in a way. They wanted to banish this byproduct, but we can treat this marginal phenomena as very productive ones. And that is what Mary Douglas writes about 
the new cosmos is produced by the new chaos and something that uh, could desecrate, could turn into something sacred and become part of this sacred purification. One of the examples of this new order is the concept that was elaborated by Bakhtin. He comes up with something grotesque, with the idea of the grotesque, something that uh, is part of this new bodily canon and his uh, private uh, writings show us that sometimes he would uh, try on a hat or and see how he, what he looks like and i think we can find this approach in artistic practices when this that is being rejected or uh, being uh, pushed away could be used uh, for uh, artworks, could be used for us to explore the nature of body. There is the picture of the, you see many fold noses, everything is turned into a nose. And then also putting together something that comes from the elderly and from the young emerging that together or overcoming the limits of the body and the disintegration of the body there are some wonderful designers and Irina Balakshana mentioned them in her book experimental fashion uh, there are some designers who work with the idea of the grotesque something that is rejected by the mass culture and something that we can see in the photos that are banned by the guidelines on the looks in instagram thank you very much Ksenia, thank you so much it was really interesting i could see that there is certain reference uh, between your various talks and uh, they sort of communicate with each other and it allows us to think together about this interesting topics using some strict concepts. I would propose that we don't stop here. We're still slightly falling behind the schedule. Now, I would like to give the floor to the next speaker and later we can have a Q&A session. Do you agree? Can we do that? All right, very good. The next presentation is going to be made Jana, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Irina. Lady colleagues, I'm glad to be here with you today and glad to speak about my research. I'm going to speak about the femme fatale in the noir films. You'll also see the title in Russian. Yes, we see your screen. Could you make a fool, please? Thank you, that's great. My topic is a bit more in retrospect, I would say, compared to the more uh, relevant issues discussed by previous speakers, but it's also part of our tactile uh, world and the perception of the female images in cinema. The film noir that I'm going to talk about today, uh, by I mean the classical uh, Hollywood films in 1940s, 1950s, that have an existential tone to them, quite a dark style. The, uh, unfortunately, film noir is not uh, researched enough as a phenomenon because for a while it wasn't a conscious, uh, not a conscious trend. Hollywood cinema was 
rediscovered uh, by the French film directors. So many uh, Hollywood directors uh, did not even know that what they were doing was called film noir. This is a genre peculiarity. And now uh, there are still discussions whether it's a style, a genre, or a kind of a constellation which characterized the Hollywood production in that era. I don't want to go into the foundation of what film noir is and the definitions of this term. I would like to go into the interpretation of the female images in these films. As a way of introduction, I will say that the noir, film noir was inspired by the previous um, film tra trends, including the German Expressionism and Poetic Realism in France. Uh, film noir borrows some of the visual characteristics, uh, including unusual perspective and high contrast, and borrows a kind of an existential tone and some of the topics even. Film noir uh, quite often is represented as criminal drama. So this is a series of films that have a cross-genre nature to them. And most often these are uh, films with a criminal narrative. Indeed, they can be stories of murder, stories of crimes that can be performed not by gangsters, not by mafia, but by uh, most common people, including the representatives of the middle class. So these films are about the nature of murder and why people undertake this the murder. So this is a cross-genre phenomenon and it has a feature state of a criminal film, of a thriller, a detective story, a melodrama. And by in its style, it is close to a different film series that existed in the 40s in Hollywood, which is called female gothics, a term researched by Helen Hansom, a film, a British film theor theorist. She compares film noir heroines uh, with gothics, and she um, shows how different and, on, and how similar they are at the same time. So maybe some of the examples I will talk about today can be closer to female gothics, but the main body is, of course, classical noir. Since this phenomenon is fluid, there are no constants in it. Sometimes it seems that we can um, give a definition to film noir only based on some visual phenomena, but um, sometimes these attributes can be missing or uh, what can be present is just their part. It's different, for example, from Western as a genre where we can clearly define that this is a Western. This uh, genre became very recognizable later on when it is reproduced um, as ne neo noir, which is based on uh, the conventions of the classical style, but then uses it to reflect the contemporary American and European reality. And uh, the female images in film noir are, of course, um, seductive. And um, actually, we are prone to think that um, Femme Fatale is a kind of an iconic character for um, noir films, but it's not the only uh, the only role. A caring woman, a savior, is also represented. But for some reason, Femme Fatale is a kind of a cliche which repeated reproduced quite often. And <clears throat> if we take um, anybody uh, from the audience, those who uh, do not go deep into um, into noir films, so if they ask them uh, what are the characteristics of the genre, they would say femme fatale, or they would say detective, but femme fatale is not the only image. So why does it happen that the femme fatale historically um, is more important than other female images, like an independent, a businesswoman or a caring woman? The thing is that femme fatale is uh, represented so that she dominates visually. Very often the camera follows the eyes of men. And this is a male gaze 
at women, we can see this woman with the eyes of the main character and she dominates in the visual space of the film very often what is exaggerated without detailed details of her body and thus uh, the embodiment is uh, reconstructed so this is why sexual appeal is very important for her which is one of her tools um, to achieve her goals so film fatale does not just dominate on the screen uh visually but she's also very much related to constructs in clothes which are very memorable and i will show in a second how the costume constructs this image of femme fatale not just uh the technique uh, of shooting the film uh not the editing but the costumes Noir films very often contain an opposition of images. A femme fatale is juxtaposed uh, to the image of a caring woman. Uh, she has much less screen time. She is a uh, part of the saving strategy uh, for the main character. And uh, uh, the caring woman is juxtaposed to the femme fatale because one is one saves the main character and the other tries to win over him. So they work like as an angel and demon. What is interesting here is uh, the image of an independent or businesswoman, which is not a savior, which is not a seductor, but very often she's a partner uh, for the man. <clears throat> she's com a companion who produces a completely different impression. So we are going in a second to turn to this idea of an independent woman and that um, role. Is for femme fatale, the features of her role is she is aiming for independence. So behind her behavior is aiming for freedom, which she can acquire through money. This is why very often we can see avarice, uh, we can see desire to get more money, but behind, uh, but it's all just a foundation for her aiming for independence, independence from her husband. She is very rarely employed. Although many women in the 40s in the uh, in Europe and in, sec in the in uh, the United States of America were working because of the Second World War, she is very rarely employed. And if she used to be employed in the past, uh, her profession is very rarely specified. Very often, this is a career in entertainment, uh, meaning singing or dancing. So she's engaged in entertainment. And most often she's financially dependent on them because she either doesn't work or her consumption practices, including fa fashion consumption, uh, cannot be met uh, with uh, her own salary. She realizes her own sex appeal and she uses it as a way of dominating, as a way of alluring um, the main male character. So uh, what is at stake here are strategies uh, for constructing your own sex appeal. So uh, femme fatale knows how to produce a right impression on the main character and so on and so forth. Uh, she is prone to trying to get a luxury item. If she can't get it from one man, she's looking for another man to satisfy, um, to satisfy uh, that need. Very often it is about furs, fur coats, uh, her own apartment, her own house. And femme fatale is also prone to mystification. She can produce a completely misleading impression. I will say a couple of words about the caring women and the independent woman. Uh, their aim is to create a family. They show care. 
no engagement. They are quite kind in this scenario. As for the caring woman, she is quite passive uh, in most uh, scenarios, in most narratives. And uh, a caring woman, as I, as I told you before, is normally juxtaposed uh, to the femme fatale. Sometimes they are even juxtaposed in time, so the femme fatale is a woman, for example, from the man's past. The independent woman very often uh, plays an active role in the narrative of the film. She quite often takes um, a male role. She can be a detective. She can be a detective's help, uh, his secretary, his partner. She's ambitious. She provides for herself. And as for her costumes, she very rarely can boast luxury items. She has uh, day suits, which are business-like and which are very strict. They um, are more minimalist and less luxurious. Here I can see a few of the examples, even of the visual juxtaposition of a femme fatale and um, an independent woman. We can see Virginia Christine and Eva Gardner in the murderer. You can see how different uh, their costumes here. Costumes are the caring woman is in the costume, um, in the closed, very strict costume. And we can see um, the eyes. Um, for example, in the right hand frame, fr uh, frame, we can see the eyes that are all going in the direction of femme fatale, which makes you understand who is the main person in the frame. There are also some of the films where they don't, they are not visible in one and the same screen, in one and the same frame. Here, for example, the caring woman is part of the characters present. She is his savior. She brings him to uh, the to the good side. But here, uh, to the right, you see that they are juxtaposed. Uh, the caring woman is uh, from the past, uh, and the fatal is from the present. Jean Turney here, uh, to the left as femme fatale, shows, uh, a, boasts a very luxurious costume with a fuzz, and this is part of her identity, this is part of her confidence. An independent woman normally wears quite strict day daytime dresses with very geometry patterns like lines, or checks. This is a visual contrast, um, white and black or light and dark colors, which uh, shows that she's somewhere in between the caring woman and the fatal. fatal. She has part of both roles, and this is why she is different from other characters in war films. So how is um, the femme fatale's image constructed? We saw that she dominates in uh, the film material. There are a few key points here. They're enumerated on the screen. And I think we can switch uh, to a more detailed discussion of every one of them. There is a concept of the dressed body and the undressed body. Normally, the femme fatale wears an extremely open dress and the focus is on the legs. The camera focuses on the legs. So we are shown the eye of the main character following her body from her toes to her face. So uh, here we witness that the character analyzes her presence they're often in these costumes. Uh, the belly is also open, while the highest code, code prohibited to demonstrate the belly button, but some part of the belly above the belly button was open. An accented tequiety was also is also quite often visible in these films of. 40s and the 50s. Many characters appear in a film for the first time in a kind of an 
uh, as a kind of an introduction, um, they, are, they are undressed or almost undressed. Sometimes they are naked. Barbara Stelmbeck, in the first example, she's, she's wearing only a tower and she's not ashamed of that. She's staying in front of the camera longer than she could. Lana Turner, we can see again that at home she's wearing a kind of a sports suit and her presence in the screen is also an anchor for the main character's attention. We can see in co a contrast here that the closest part of the identity of femme fatale. And it's not always about having a tight fit. Um, silk, shiny clothes, again, this is uh, something that draws attention to this character. Um, the Kara school, the light shining on uh, silk clothes is something that is seen very often. More rarely, we see bits or shiny elements. Very often, uh, they represent the background of the male character, their showbiz activities. Sometimes we have lace, but it wasn't um, unanimous. So with the lace, what was needed was the use of a souffle uh, fabric, which would make the body invisible below the lace. But this illusion of the naked body and the texture of the lace is quite important. Satin can be different. It is not always silk. Sometimes it has other kinds of beefs and it produces an impression of coldness and it dominates both in evening dresses. Sorry, Tatiana, you have two minutes left. Okay, I'll speed up. Thank you, Irina. Uh, the symbols of the colors and the hues, uh, the clothes are the white and the bright hues as mystification. Sometimes we can see uh, femme fatale in white, which seems counterintuitive because the white color is associated with positive connotations or with naivety, uh, which is a mystification in this case. When we see the white color, we a priori think that maybe this is a different woman. Maybe um, she is just hiding something which is part of your real nature. So she looks very naive in this white clothes. Another example is colors. They are not um, widespread in the 40s, but still we do see the colors sometimes. In the film, you can see on the screen, uh, the character does not look like the transformations in, in her body. And here uh, you can see that she's the same color as the interiors she has to undertake an abortion or rather a murder of your unborn child and she's transformed into the blue color so she returns to the color uh, that uh, she the colors that she used before niagara marilyn monroe was wearing red at home femme fatale very often is overdressed. Their clothes are a bit more fancy than the home environment requires. Sometimes it means feathers, sometimes it means uh, high fashion. Sometimes they have elements of the male style. Uh, they're obsessed with luxury. They're aiming for better lives. Fur coats and furs are one of the key objects, a kind of a trophy. They're aiming for fur coats and it's part of their good lives. And in most cases, they gave them from lovers. 
sometimes from their husbands, but this is a constant anyway, which exists in our images. And uh, to finish my talk, I have to say that the transformation into femme fatale can happen vestimentarily in the clothes. Uh, this is one of the transformation. This is a woman that has to tries to save the main character, but then she needs to collect information about uh, the night, um, which po which put uh, the man under suspicion. So to seduce uh, one of the witnesses, she turns into this kind of a femme fatale. This is a, quite a vulgar image, but she draws the attention with the same um, strategies that the femme fatale uses. So one might say that in the context of femme fatale, we can see interdependencies which are created by the costume, which can help us interpret her image. Through costume design, through using hue, through the usage of hues and uh, hues and colors, and the double impression that they can uh, provide, and we can see a clear correlation. The femme fatale in fin noir is a fashion figure. She is the closest to the fashion context. Woman, okay, this is it. Thank you very much. And sorry if it took me a bit more time. Thank you. I think it is quite important to differentiate these three female emploi. Now I suggest we switch to Olga Nikolaeva, who is going to talk about theory design. Видно мою презентацию. Все работает. Thank you very much. I uh, thought that although my talk is quite different from the previous ones, I still consider here the aspects that we have analyzed already, like the speed, the materiality, uh, the audience's impression. And this talk is part of my big research, which I am conducting now, and it is related to the representation of trauma created in contemporary Russian theater by women directors and, and set designers. First of all, I would like to, uh, to explain how I understand set design. The most recent approaches to set design is related to understanding the role of objects and the interrelationship between the animate and inanimate objects as a main moving force of communication of performance, which can produce cognitive and effective um, influence on uh, the audience. Since my main goal is to analyze uh, the possibilities for representing trauma and the traumatic experience in a stage practice, I focus on the role that the materiality plays Here, I take the set design as a sum of material and immaterial objects, animate and inanimate objects, including actors and their bodies, audiences and their bodies, um, objects and immaterial objects like light, sound, and so on. So I consider a set design not as a background, but as, a, as an important agent of what is happening. I also consider set design McKinney and Puma are my references and, and here I see a scenography as an experience or as a possibility not as a single individual I see and here I make another reference to Rachel Han who uh, considers scenography as an intervention situation which is able to turn the space of performance into 
effective space. And he also says that the scenography can be considered not as something that organizes the narrative space, but as an author of the created situation, as an agent of uh, interaction and communication. And the last point of how I treat scenography in my work is the role of the audience, which is uh, who plays an active part in a show, mostly through this kind of visceral and sensory interaction. Trauma and representation is my main topic, and here I want to turn to culture analyst Griselda Pollock, who in her article Art, Trauma and Representation asks us to be careful when we deal with the representation of trauma. She emphasizes that this transition into the temporal space of the narration does not just embrace but also um, suppresses the haunting force of trauma through structuring its representation so uh, this representation creates a distance between our understanding of the traumatic experience and what Pollock calls the essence of trauma. She also highlights that there is a symbolic process too, which is caused by a kind of a clash with the traces of trauma. And it's the only possibility to uh, not to perceive the trauma as a story, it's a narrative. She also says that the performative process in an art piece, in my case, they are performances, uh, which, in, which indicates its own time and creates a new space for a clash can become a place for a transformative impression. Uh, sorry. Since I attempt to consider the special practices uh, in theater art uh, that represent trauma and traumatic experience, I focus on this only. So this is about filling the void, the stenography of the void. And here I lean on uh, Horton, a theater theory, a theorist who stresses that suffering is something personal and uh, something very difficult, especially when it happens in a collective context. And as Horton thinks, the process of the stage action, the context of which creates conditions for the juxtaposition of two aspects of perception, including the embodied knowledge and viscerally effective experience creates a shared space in which the unspeakable will aim for articulation and understanding. Uh, um, and in this context, I would like to analyze two performances, two shows that work with traumatic experience in the context of war conflicts. The first show, which I want to draw attention to, is uh, set by a small St. Petersburg-based theater, it's called 872 Days, the Voices of the Sieged City, directed by Tatiana Voronina, the set designer Elena Zhukova. Um, it was staged in 2019 based on the book by Kranin and Voronin, the book that was censored for a long time. It also uses the diaries of the people who survived the siege of Leningrad. In this piece, uh, we see the historical world uh, 
of the siege of Leningrad and the contemporary time. We can also say that the actors are moving across the transparent cube and it is covered by the pages from their personal diaries. They don't address neither each other nor the audience, only one character, and you can see her here. She uh, has a dialogue with other actors and she's the only person to gaze at the audience. And she's also placed within this glass cube. Whereas other actors represent those who died during the siege of Leningrad, the glass represents the border between the lie, the living and the dead. And uh, that is why this actress uh, has a different mode than the other actors. And she, you can see that uh, she's dressed a bit differently, but everybody's wearing some very simple clothes. This lady, uh, she has a coat and uh, her hair is done. You can't see it right now from the picture, but she's the only one also who's wearing shoes. All other people are barefoot. So she is in this border area between the world of the living and the world of the dead. As Kathy Harris notes, there is a direct parallel in literature between survival and trauma. In her book, Unclaimed Experience, Trauma, Narrative and History, Harris notes that trauma exists between the history of unbearable events and the story of the unbearable survival. This performance is put within the space uh, that is limited by glass walls. This is the metaphorical wall between the past and the present, between the world of the dead and the world of the living. One more example is the performance that was put by a women's collective and it's called Counting Rhyme. It uh, was directed by Jenya Berkovic and the artistic director was uh, Ksenia Sorokina. This is a story about two girls who are 23 years old. Their names are Nincha and Knopa and they are put amidst uh, the conflict between Abkhazia and Georgia and it's a forgotten story. These girls are the main characters and all other characters are personified by puppets or dolls. For during these three days uh, that the story takes place in, uh, we are told a story about this teen, this young girls. They're talking to different people. They're taking care of the elderly, and at the same time, they also help the drug trafficker to smuggle uh, drugs, and they're also helping uh, to rob a pharmacy shop in another city to get food and the drugs they need. At the end of the book, uh, Knopa, one of the girls, dies. The performance contrasts this uh, young girls and their lives 
with the war and the expectation of death, and it is uh, represented by the world of puppets. This performance was uh, made especially for the place where it was performed, that people and the audience move across different rooms. There are various objects and sounds that work within the space. The scenography is really important uh, for any performative process in theater today because it allows us to understand that uh, scenography impacts uh, the physical state and the emotional state of the audience. At the very end of the performance, the audience enters a corridor, and this is a humanitarian corridor or the waiting room where there is no border between the living and the dead. This closeness and maybe a specific distance that you saw at the previous performance allows us to come closer to realizing what traumatic experience is. Since sense-making processes use the speech of the actors and effects are also important for the performance, therefore there should be some specific interaction not only between actors but between inanimate objects and the actors. That all creates the effect, effective ambience of the performance. So here on, it, on the left, we see that there is this glass wall that separates uh, the actors from the audience. They attach pages from books to the walls. Uh, they read the letters that are attached to it. The only living character, the lady that we spoke about, she's uh, trying to break away through this wall. This uh, stories of the past and of the lives of the people, the choreography of the movement of actors that takes the attention of the viewer sometimes appears and disappears. At the, on the picture on the right, there is the counting rhyme performance. You can see that there are there is cloth on the floor and uh, it symbolizes the bodies of the people who passed away during the war one of the women in the one of the women in the village wants to burn the cloth and uh, to uh, bid, bid farewell to the past but they're wearing the clothes that is made of the same material here, I should underscore that a lot of elements are aimed at uh, creating a certain atmosphere and a set of effects, and, but yet there are a lot of other things that I could have spoken about. In conclusion, I would like uh, to say that representing trauma is uh, an area that's been explored within uh, the art criticism of Erin Hapton claims that representing trauma is seeking ways uh, to 
understand, cover and manage any attempts at overcoming trauma, regardless of the uniqueness of each context. The performative environment, as Hathen writes, creates the space for liberation, for awareness, and I hope uh, the space for sincerity. Thank you. Olga, thank you so much. Your report's been a bit different from the previous one, but it sort of adds a performative aspect to our discussion. And I think it uh, rounds up nicely our panel. Right now it's a 1441. Uh, the round table is going to begin at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, would you like to have a break or continue our discussion? Let's have a compromise. Let's uh, have a small tiny discussion for a couple of minutes and uh, then we'll break for 15 minutes to eat something. So are there any questions? Please. I'm ready to take them. A question to Olga or to other presenters. We've had a very active discussion, a lively discussion. Talk. Uh, oh, I'm not sure. Could you read the comments? I think uh, we'll have the chat saved and so that uh, you could read all the comments later on. If there are no brief remarks, and I think that maybe we all got a bit tired, so I think we might uh, finish here. Uh, thanks uh, to organizers, to the keynote speakers, to all the participants. Uh, oh, Ksenia, you have a question. Oh, no, she was applauding. She raised... I raised both my hands. I was applauding. Okay, right. Let's applaud our presenters. I thank all of you and see you at other panels.